Hello and welcome to chapter 18, Global Climate Change. So basically, uh, chapter 18 is the pinnacle of everything that we've been talking about thus far. It basically summarizes what climate change actually is, and it connects everything that we've looked at in the previous 17 chapters. So hopefully by the end of this video, you really, really do understand global climate change and our uh, urgency to make some changes here. Okay, so let's start out by taking a look at climate change at a glance. So global warming. A lot of people use the two terms climate change and global warming interchangeably, but really they aren't the exact same. Global warming is a type of climate change. So global warming basically just refers to the general warming of our planet's climate. Greenhouse gases. So I'm sure we've, uh, you've heard the term before environmental science and then many times in environmental science. But a greenhouse gas is basically any atmospheric gas with three or more atoms, uh, such as CO2, N2O, CH4, even CFCs, etc. And uh, what happens is there's something known as the greenhouse effect, which you can see in this visual here. So basically, these gases absorb infrared radiation in the atmosphere. Then what happens is these same gases re-emit some of the radiation back out, and this warms up the troposphere. So greenhouse gases are natural and they're not inherently bad. The problem is that we are producing them in massive amounts and in unnatural ways. So basically the issue is that we're producing too much CO2 and too much N2O compared to what nature is able to normally sustain. Basically uh, these gases are uh, put into the atmosphere by fossil fuel use, deforestation for instance in the case of CO2. So there's a term known as uh, radiative forcing, which is basically a way to measure the amount of change in thermal energy that a given factor causes. So that's how a lot of the damage is uh, calculated in this sense. Okay, let's take a look at non-anthropogenic causes. So as we just discussed uh, last video and many videos before, anthropogenic basically just means human cause. So it's something that we're actually doing. So... Um, there are some theories, there are those people that don't believe that humans are the cause of global warming, and while many scientists, pretty much 100% of them almost uh, disagree with that, there are all these other theories, and so these are just some other theories that could contribute on top of human causes, or maybe not at all if you don't believe that uh, humans are causing global warming at all. Regardless, uh, there are four main ones that we can look at quickly. So the Milankovitch cycle, that basically uh, refers to the uneven heating of the world due to rotation. Then there's solar output, ocean, absorp uh, ocean absorption, excuse me, and ocean circulation. And so basically they all describe either like cyclic changes in Earth's rotation and orbit, variation in energy released by the sun, absorption of carbon dioxide by the oceans, and ocean circulation patterns. So these are just some alternate um, potential causes. Okay, so now let's take a look at measuring climate change. So there's something known as paleoclimate, which is basically just uh, old weather conditions from a long time ago or old weather patterns from a long time ago. So we can look at our friends from the feature film Ice Age down here if we want to talk about the Ice Age, for instance. So basically, uh, we use proxy indicators to measure the past uh, weather. So then from there, we can base um, weather changes and weather patterns currently on how the weather used to be. Uh, in the present, we use direct measurements to monitor uh, climate change conditions, and then uh, in order to measure the potential future, we use models based on what we know currently. Okay, so now let's just take a brief look at the IPCC. So that stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and basically that group consists of hundreds of scientists who produce the most respected thorough analyses of uh, climate change. So uh, one of the few reports that you should know, or at least be familiar with, that they published is known as the Fourth Assessment Report. And that basically just states all the current climate change theories that we're going to talk about very soon. So rising temperatures, rising ocean levels, etc. Okay, so that carries us over into the actual climate change effects. So these are going to be the things that we're actually going to start seeing happen if we don't make a change. Or maybe they might even be inevitable at this point and we just need to figure out how to cope with them. The first of these is temperatures rising. So we all know global warming and we all know that this is bringing up our overall global temperatures. So basically this is melting ice, this is raising ocean levels, this is the cause of a lot of things. So we need to figure out how to work with this. 
The next is we know climate change is triggering some uh, strange weather patterns and storm patterns, just as with El Nino and La Nina, as we just discussed. Uh, the next change that we're going to look at is melting ice caps. So that happens because of these rising temperatures. So all of the Greenland ice caps and things of that nature are going to start melting away, and that's going to trigger the ocean levels rising. So there you go. The ocean levels will be rising because of the rising temperatures and because of the melting ice caps. So as you can see, really everything's interconnected. Now an important thing to note is that these effects are going to really affect all people and ecosystems. It's going to be hard to produce agriculture as we do, forestry is going to change, health is going to change, and our economies are going to change. Here's obviously a computer-generated image of uh, Manhattan and New York City, but uh, by 2080, this is actually a potential problem. New York City and Manhattan might be underwater if we don't figure out a solution. So these are really, really pending issues that we need to figure out what to do. Okay, so after examining some potential uh, effects of climate change and global warming, let's take a quick look at some potential response plans. So first here we have mitigation versus adaption. So mitigation is the current approach that many of us are prone to, and that's basically creating new green technologies. Comparatively, adaption is basically saying, okay, these climate changes are inevitable, so let's just keep doing what we're doing and adapt our world to this new changing uh, planet. Something to note is that uh, in the U.S., surprisingly, electricity is producing the most greenhouse gases. So that's the first place that we should start, look at, and see how we can adapt to limit those emissions. So now from there, let's take a look at some options that we can use to bring down these potential effects of uh, climate change. The first is conserve our usage. So we can conserve our usage of electricity, and you can do this on your own or on a global scale. It's just the idea of conservation of resources. Next here, we have find new resources and technology. So if you're uh, more keen on the mitigation approach here, this is your answer. So think of electric cars or wind power or just getting off of fossil fuels entirely in order to change the planet. Next here, we have an interesting concept known as carbon capture. Basically what that means is you would capture, release carbon and CO2 and take it out of the atmosphere. So then you would store it somewhere so that you can still produce carbon, except it's just not going into the atmosphere and causing that greenhouse effect. And lastly, a simple option is just take different uh, transportation methods. So instead of driving your car everywhere, maybe take the train, maybe take the bus, take some mass transit. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Kyoto Protocol and the Copenhagen Conference. So the Kyoto Protocol took place in uh, 2005, and it was basically a huge international gathering of countries in order to figure out how to combat this global climate change epidemic. And basically, the plan that they landed on is that as an international community, we should aim to reduce emission uh, amounts and levels to the levels they were at in the 1990s between 2008 and 2012. Something important to note about the Kyoto Protocol, however, is that the U.S. didn't ratify it and it didn't agree to anything that the uh, Kyoto Protocol actually called for. So as you would imagine, the international community wasn't exactly happy about this, considering that the U.S. by itself emits about a fifth of the world's emissions. Uh, so the U.S. didn't take any responsibility, and so it seemed as somewhat of a failure, the Kyoto Protocol. In 2009, the Copenhagen uh, Conference occurred, and that was basically supposed to pick up where the Kyoto Protocol left off. However, that also was ineffective. So cumulatively, looking at the Kyoto Protocol and the Copenhagen Conference, the real issue is that there's no formal authority to guarantee anyone doing as they say they will. So yeah, sure, China could say that they'll cut their emissions by this much, but who's going to actually monitor that they do that? So this carries us over into the responsibility category. As you would imagine, it's pretty difficult to put any exact responsibility on a country, corporation, or specific person when discussing global climate change, because who wants to take responsibility for destroying the planet? Therefore, there are a couple options that are uh, put into use now in order to put a little bit of responsibility on people. The first of which is the cap-and-trade system, which we have discussed before. But just to refresh, basically the cap-and-trade system creates a market for uh, emissions. So if you want to emit more CO2 or you want to emit less CO2, you can buy and, sh uh, and sell shares that allow you to emit any certain amount. Comparatively, a carbon tax uh, is a little more stringent and strict. So people that think the cap-and-trade system is a little too weak uh, believe in what is known as a carbon tax. 
So that's basically exactly what it sounds like. You're taxed for every uh, unit of uh, greenhouse gas emission that you produce. So when examining responsibility, there is a, uh, a way to handle this on a very easy personal level. And that's just by reducing your personal emissions. So even though it doesn't seem like it would make a big significant impact on the global scale, if a lot of people start doing it and they're a little more conscious, we might begin to see a little bit of change. Okay, so this carries us right on into the conclusion. As we all know at this point, climate change is a very real global issue. Therefore, we need to figure out an agreeable global plan as soon as possible. Okay, in chapter 19, we're going to take a look at fossil fuels, their impacts, and energy conservation. Thank you and see you next time.